Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the 2021 Diving Incident Report for the dive industry. Um, my name is Dominic Robinson. I'm the head of diving and training for the British Tobacco Club, and I'm just going to uh, open things today and, and I'll provide a brief summary. Uh, my colleague Jim Watson, the safety and instance advisor, will, will do the meat of the presentation. But if you could give us the next slide, please, Jim. So, um, yeah, so a little bit about the, the incident report, which is uh, a piece of work that the British Tobacco Club has produced uh, in our role as a national governing body since the early 1960s. Uh, and as you can see from the, the slide there, we've uh, logged the number of fatalities in particular uh, for, for, for quite a long time. And on the back of that, we've been able to, uh, you know, we've had a, a very good view of what has happened um, through a long period of time. And the current database that we use has been going since 1997. So that's once again, 20, 25 years worth of, of really detailed uh, reports on incidents, well, detailed on some of the incidents anyway. And then we've used the information that we receive from all the different sources, and Jim will talk about those, uh, to produce an annual incident report. And the annual incident report is, is published online, uh, made available to, to anybody who wants to access it, to, to download and to read. It contains a, a summary of each incident, but also statistics and um, you know particular things that we extract from that that we think would be useful for the the wider community and 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 for ourselves. Obviously, we uh, we use the the trends that we identify um, to inform our training development. Um, so, a good example in recent years would be uh, IPO. Which is which has come out through the incident reports, and I think along with a lot of other agencies, where where uh, we're using that to change the information that we give to trainees. But also, we provide safety advice uh, that is there particularly for our members, but is once again public source, so it's available for anybody to to use if they think it would be useful. And we also contribute to the wider industry, not just through presentations. Uh, such as this, but also through attendance at the various different bodies uh, that are interested in uh, recreational diving safety. Um, <clears throat> so it's it's something we do for everybody, and uh, you know that's why I'm so pleased to see you know representatives from many different organisations represented here, and and why we're really grateful as well to the uh, information that all the different organisations provide to us as well, and, and that all gets captured in the uh, instant report, and so that everybody. Uh, hopefully gets a, a, a fuller picture of what's going on. So um, that's that's a little bit of an introduction. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Jim, who is going to talk you through the, the meat of the presentation. Thanks, Tom. Um, just before I start, if I can just remind everybody uh, or anybody that missed the introductory slide, uh, can you keep your video cameras uh, switched off? Uh, just helps with the bandwidth and minimizes the risk of the whole system crashing. Um, uh, and also keep your microphones off. They, sh they should be blocked anyway. Uh, but most importantly, if you have any questions throughout this presentation, uh, if you can put them in the chat and we'll have a question and answer session at the end and answer as many questions as we can uh, with the, the time that we've got available. Um, so, first of all, if I can start with uh, some thanks, and, and in particular, thanks to everyone who took the time to uh, submit incident reports in one form or another. Um, we accept reports not just from our own members, but from rescue agencies like the MCA and RNLI, uh, but also other UK based training organisations, and in particular, um, the, um, the, the more common agencies like PADI, uh, IANTD, um, and uh, RAID. And in recent years, we've had reports submitted by uh, CFT, which is the Irish Underwater Council, and that's had a an impact on our reports, as I'll explain to you later, and also. Uh, a number of the inland sites contribute to the data. Uh, and then some thanks for uh, 
uh, people who contributed to the analysis so Ben Petty for his work on the statistical side of it uh, which aids tremendously the, the data analysis and his um, my fellow instance advisor Claire Petty um, for her continued support in helping analyse the data and Ron Evans and Alison Dando for helping with proofing. Um, so what I'm going to cover today is within the presentation is a, is a brief uh, section on um, the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, a review of the incident data for the 2021 incident reporting year and finish off with uh, some advice on using the incident report and some conclusions uh, from 2021 and then, and then Don will um, talk to you a little bit about how to access um, some of the information from the report but in particular uh, the exact safety information and then we'll open it up to questions that uh, you may have submitted. Um, so uh, as Don identified since 1997 the current database has allowed us to pull together um, and collate a number of incidents every year and um, those incidents uh, since 2018 have related to um, a, a slight change in our incident reporting period. Um, previously it was October to September to fit in more appropriately with the diving season but in 2018 we changed it to a 1st of January to 31st of December period. So this data that we're going to present now will relate to the year January to December uh, 2021. Um, and in previous years, between 2014 and 2018, uh, we identified uh, that there was perhaps a, uh, a levelling of the reported number of incidents over that period to around about 250. Um, we then identified that 2019 was illustrated by this very significant spike um, back to a level prior to 2014 or even more in excess of it. And at the time we attributed that to that year being particularly good diving weather. Um, uh, and we hoped that uh, in subsequent years, we would either get confirmation that there was a, either a continued increase in diving activity or a, a, a return to the previous five years data. Um, and then along came 2020 where what we actually saw was a very significant drop um, in the number of incidents and um, unlike 2019 the reason for that was pretty clear. So the early part of the season started off somewhere along the same kind of lines and then in April there was this massive drop uh, and that uh, for those of you in the UK at least know um, was very much in line with the, the sudden impact halfway through March of COVID-19 which led to in April um, effectively a complete ban on diving within the UK and um, you may say well why was there one incident there um, and if you look at the 20 uh, 20 reports you may be able to identify why that was and then progressively as the year uh, limited shore diving was allowed uh, until we got to November where uh, in England and Wales there was a further return to restrictions so the the decline in diving incidents is likely to be reflective of the impact of, of COVID-19. Um, so if we now look at the 2021 reporting year uh, what we've seen is um, 235 incidents into the, entered into the database uh, and 218 of those uh, were UK diving incidents of um, that represent sport diving of all affiliations um, and, and by recreational diving we mean um, both fun diving if you like 
and recreational diver training incidents. Uh, it excludes commercial diving, uh, things like um, oil and gas offshore activities, um, inland diving, uh, commercial scallop and razor fish diving, that sort of thing. Um, and we also report on uh, overseas incidents where um, the the number of um, the reports on incidents throughout the world that have some BSSC involvement, but in addition to that, for the last five or six years, um, because we've been getting data from the Irish Underwater Council, then we've been reporting on all era incidents within the overseas events uh, to reflect the data that we're getting there and because it's uh, to a large extent comparable conditions to the, the rest of the UK. Uh, and so what we've seen in 2021 uh, is a return to fairly close to the previous trend um, which at the moment we are reasonably conf uh, confident um, is a, a continuation of that trend and therefore uh, gives us a degree of confidence that 2019 was attributable to more diving because of the weather and 2020 was um, attributable in large part to um, the impact of the COVID pandemic. Um, so looking at the, the monthly distribution of incidents, the, the red columns are the average between 2016 and 2020. Uh, and what we've seen for a number of years now is this, uh, what you might describe as a fairly typical sinusoidal trend, uh, whereas the, the weather improves, you get this increase in diving activity and then a slow tail off to the latter end of the year. Um, uh, and then in 2021, the impact of the, the second wave of um, lockdown uh, carried on through to March, so you've got a depressed level of uh, the number of incidents, but then an increase in incidents as dive, people return to diving uh, and very much UK orientated diving, uh, but following a similar kind of trend. Uh, and what we have lost since about 2013 is that there used to be a trend where you got an early season spike and then a drop off and then a, a rise again. And we lost that trend around about 2013 and, and it's continued since then. And, and the, the only thing of note is this slight depression of August um, related incidents, which may become clear from some of the sources. Um, so looking at the sources of in incident information, so um, the, the majority of what we get is from BZAC incident reports submitted by members uh, or using the online form, um, but we get a fair number of reports from the UK Coast Guard and the RNLI and, and then other sources. And from the 2021 report, the, the B site reports seem to be a, a little bit um, down uh, by about 20 to 25 reports. Um, but we believe that's in part at least uh, due to one of the uh, significant contributors to the reports in the past uh, in the form of AT training uh, within the, the UK military. Uh, where recreational diving is taking part as, within that environment, but the, the, um, they were under longer constraints from diving activity than was the, the case in the, the general population. So um, we believe that, that that's the, the main impact there, uh, and that should reflect because the, there is no so longer at the same restrictions, then that should reflecting a, a more normal distribution from those sources uh, for the 2022 reporting year. Uh, on the other hand, Coast Guard reporting was uh, up slightly um, in, in comparison and some of that we believe is due to um, the, the change in um, 
reporting systems and, and in particular the Coast Guard Diving Liaison Officer. Um, and, and so the, there's less uh, filtering out or, or checking uh, for deduplication within the Coast Guard reporting. And, and if you read through the reports um, in the um, miscellaneous, there, there are a significant number of uh, false alarms reported by the Coast Guard, um, but false alarms with good intent that involve divers. And, and in previous years, some of those have been filtered out. So um, we um, distribute or uh, allocate diving incidents to one of eight categories of, of incidents. Um, uh, and in, in terms of that, that doesn't mean to say that the other categories weren't present, but we tend to allocate to the more serious uh, category. Uh, so, for example, fatalities might have involved an ascent, might have uh, involved an equipment failure, um, uh, and you know, but the more serious consequence clearly was the fatality. So we allocate it to that miscellaneous, and and this is the the increase in. Uh, where those false alarms with good intent are, um, we believe, the reason for this increase uh, are ones that don't fit any of the other seven categories. Um, but from the 2021 report, uh, first thing to note is that the number of ascents, um, either fast, abnormal, missed safety or decompression stops, um, is significantly down. And we believe um, and, and indeed hope that that's down to the, the work of BZAC and other training organisations to place an emphasis on um, encouraging divers to prepare for a return to diving after the, the enforced layoff. Um, and so, you know, that, that's hopefully a sign of the, the efforts that we all make leading to that um, improvement. Um, DCI and injury are, are put together here uh, as we commonly do simply because quite often um, it, it's not clear whether or not um, an injury, so a diver airlifted off a, a dive boat for example and taken to hospital, we, we don't often get the follow-up that says that they were recompressed and without that evidence, then we allocate it to something else. But if you look at DCI and injury in any particular year, on average, they, they tend to level out. And some of the injuries might be uh, DCI, some of the DC, reported DCI might be an injury um, instead, but um, slightly misreported, but overall, we, we seek to capture that information. Um, we're at bottom and surfing uh, surface slightly up um, uh, and we question uh, but don't have the evidence at the moment whether or not that was down to a lack of maintenance um, of the, the vessels prior to repair um, some longer term trend analysis and look at that um, initially very briefly later on. Um, and then fatalities up slightly um, in, in comparison to the um, five year rolling trend, uh, but we'll look at detail, um, fatalities in more detail later on. Uh, and then equipment is up actually up quite a bit. Um, and we, we again question whether or not that's uh, a lack of checking and having the equipment serviced prior to returning after the layoff, uh, despite the advice, or is it something else? And again, longer term trends may help that. Uh, and miscellaneous we've already discussed. Uh, so looking at the some of the sources of reports, um, so this represents the, the Coast Guard, and again, the red bars are the, the rolling average and the 20, 21 figure is in blue. Uh, and so uh, what you see is this 
early season depression and then um, this significant increase but uh, in particular the, the depression in August so and what's interesting to me at least and the other advisors is uh, that the June to September number of incidents, incidents reported by the Coast Guard represents 72 percent of all of the incidents that they reported in 2021 um, but you have this depression in um, August and, and don't have an explanation for that at the moment. Um, I was speculating with a colleague over the weekend um, that possibly it's the opening up of overseas travel uh, and for divers that you know have been relying very much on UK diving um, had they suddenly taken the opportunity to go overseas but then the September spike uh, sort of puts lay to that. Um, helicopter involvement is frequently associated with DCI um, and um, missing lost divers uh, and similar to the Coast Guard but same period of time um, a significant increase in um, or a si significant representation of that year's diving incidents responded to by helicopters of 81% overall. Uh, and then RNLI assistance, similar trend, um, in some respects not quite the same as um, the Coast Guard in the, with the exception of June and September where the number of re responses was higher than in, in the, the five year average, the rest of the time it was pretty much lower. Um, but it still reflects this same percentage coverage as the, the Coast Guard not least because it's normally the Coast Guard that tasks the RNLI, same as the helicopters. Uh, but again, the, the same depression in August. Um, so looking at diving incidents and, and the, the maximum depth of the, the dive where the incident derived from, the, the single biggest change um, is in this um, increase in the number of unknowns and, and not to a large extent and that's because of uh, changes during 2021 and, and to a certain extent to the, the changes in reporting at the back end of uh, 2020 from one of those sources um, where the level of detail that we got in comparison to previous was very, very significantly down. Um, so very limited information about depths, detail of the incident and in one of those sources, no information uh, whatsoever about location and that sort of thing. And that, and that doesn't help us, but uh, particularly, but what we've done is used um, as much as we possibly can from the analysis and, and really what you can see from this is that the number of unknowns was at, you know over the previous five years was about 74, 75, towards 75 incidents uh, and so it's simply been an increase in that uh, but the overall trend of the rest of it is still somewhat in line. Um, whereas uh, surface related incidents um, have shown an increase and, that, and that's um, the um, a, a little bit of extrapolation from one of those data sources um, that where we've got limited information but where it relates for example to um, or mechanical breakdown then clearly that uh, there wasn't a maximum depth it was a surface related incident um, but hopefully we can um, try and get uh, a little bit more data from those sources in the future. Uh, on the other hand the, the incidents where the depth began um, is much more 
in line with the, the normal trends for the unknown, the, the numbers are comparable. And for the, the depths underwater where an incident occurred, we tend to get um, that some of that information. Um, the surface related incident tends to be um, both able to be extrapolated in the, in the way that I just described, uh, but also DCI um, is a big reflection there in that the, although the cause of the DCI may, will have been underwater, it first becomes apparent on the surface sometime after the dive so is reported as a surf, uh, the incident happening at the surface, likewise uh, boat breakdown or divers missing on the surface would fall into that category and therefore um, this increase that's shown here um, is to an extent, uh, some extent due to that extra extrapolation of the, the boating surface incident. Um, so if we can move on now to a little bit of consideration of uh, diving fatalities, just bear with me a second. Um, so during 2021, uh, unfortunately, we report on 16 UK fatalities, uh, and that is during 15 incidents. So unfortunately, one of those incidents was a, a double fatality. Uh, and out of the 16, eight are BZAC members, and the, the uh, chart that Bob uh, that Don showed you previously, uh, going back to 1964, is the um, the fatality trends over those times uh, and we've always reported on the number of BZAC members that were involved in, and the uh, number of non-BZAC members. Uh, and one of the most common trends throughout all of that time is that the, there is a lot of unknown in um, those incidents um, which doesn't help particularly with the analysis of them and the understanding of them um, but um, during 2021, there was um, nine of those incidents where there was very significant lack of information. Um, so this table will build up over the, the next few minutes um, and each of these lines across the top will build relating to a single incident, uh, um, person fatality. Uh, and try and draw some conclusions, but also intersperse it with um, some additional information as well, um, both from uh, previous incident reports for this particular audience. Um, so the, the first consideration is that in, in four of these incidents, um, the, there was either confirmed evidence of a medical problem or possible um, or probable um, implication of a medical consideration. So that's natural causes, not diving related. Um, uh, and for a number of years now, we've been uh, highlighting the uh, potential implications of immersion pulmonary edema in uh, diving incidents. And what we look for is evidence of some of the factors, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and so in five of the incidents where we've got information, um, the, there's five of those incidents where we believe there is still uh, an indication that they may be, um, that the impact may be of immersion pulmonary edema. Uh, and three of the incidents, we know that the, the person became under, unconscious whilst in the water. And so just uh, immersion pulmonary edema to just expand on that a little bit. Um, so um, in recent years, uh, Dr. Peter Wilms has um, raised the concern that, the, um, that that led to a growing awareness of this potentially serious problem. IPO was first described by Dr. Wilms in the 1980s and was thought by the, the 
dive training organizations, the medical professional, including Dr. Wilmsist himself, uh, to be a very rare occurrence. Um, but in recent times, the, the evidence seems to be growing that it, it's actually less rare than we previously considered, and it may be providing an explanation as to the circumstances and the causes behind some of the diving fatalities. And Dom will talk briefly at the end about where you can find more information about that. Um, but that what we're what we've been advising since that time is to to pay attention both in yourself and in your body whilst diving um, some of the indicators that that could be a prelude or an indicator that emotion pulmonary edema may be happening uh, and that's uh, i was suffering breathing difficulties without apparent reason so not on a strenuous dive and and your breathing rate increasing significantly um, rapid, uneven or heavy breathing, coughing uncontrollably, uh, confusion, um, divers agreeing to a buddy agreeing to a signal to head back to the shot line and then swimming off in the opposite direction or um, not swimming in any uh, particular ordered behaviour or, or doing something that is very unusual for that diver. Uh, belief that a regulator is malfunctioning, that it's not giving you gas, where in actual fact it's, they've been shown to be working perfectly well um, subsequently, uh, or signalling out of gas when the, the regulator is clearly working, uh, and having signalled that you need uh, additional gas, refusing or rejecting an alternate source, and, and then once out of the water, difficulty breathing when you're on the surface uh, and the, the advice is that if apparent about the dive um, make sure that you accompany your, your buddy that's having difficulties to the surface as long as it's safe to do so um, there have been a, a number of incidents where um, a diver was clearly having difficulties on a safety stop and the, the drifted up to the surface and was found unconscious on the non-breathing on the surface and was not able to be resuscitated and, and part of that is because of the drop in oxygen partial pressure um, during that change in, in depth um, and so the key thing is to return to the surface as safely as quickly as possible and get out of the water and then having got out of the water seek medical advice um, very much a whistle stop tour, but worth investigating further if you haven't come across it previously. Um, so other factors that we look at, we reported for a number of years uh, on the, the correlation between diver separation and, and fatalities. And some of that diver separation um, isn't necessarily because the dive group was in a, a tree or more, uh, but um, if there is, the, the, there is some correlation between uh, TRIO and the potential for separation. Um, there was a, um, two known situations where there, were, there was an element of solo diving within the dive, uh, but in two of the unknowns, the, we question whether or not uh, it was also part of it. Um, and, and, you know, the, whether or not we managed to get further information on that, I'm not sure. Uh, what was particularly unusual in the 2021 reporting year was the, the number of divers that were recorded as missing, uh, i.e. were separated from um, the body and, and remained under the water for a period of time on their own. Um, some of those were recovered within minutes um, by uh, other divers intervening and going searching for them or coming across them inadvertently and recovering them. Uh, some were um, a matter of days or weeks later uh, and in one incident sadly um, 
as far as the, the to the best of my knowledge is the diver is still missing um, but 11 out of 16 is quite a significant increase in the number of um, recorded missing divers um, Going on to other factors, um, there was three reported incidents of uh, clearly a, a rapid ascent being involved in the uh, fatality uh, and similarly th three resulting, of, uh, res resulting from or, uh, or in uh, an out of gas situation. Um, so again, I'd like to break out here and, and in the 2018 report, uh, we did some analysis on the efficacy of rescue techniques um, and looked at five particular areas. Uh, and so in alternate source, control bank lift, CPR and oxygen enriched CPR, the data at that time uh, was um, over a period of 2013 to 2018 inclusive. Um, and for AED use, um, because the numbers were relatively small, then we extracted data from the entire database. And for AED, the, there was a total of 20 incidents where an AED was reported to have been used. And uh, six of those presented, resulted in a successful outcome, um, which represents 30% uh, success rate, um, which is above what's um, the norm um, for other rescues involved uh, involving AED. Um, well, the others, um, alternate source, the, the definition of success was um, the casualty reaching the surface without having to use a free ascent. So not that they died from um, the failure of that alternate source technique, but something caused them um, to uh, not follow the, the AS ascent through to the surface. Some of that might well have been uh, because of the implications of something like IPO. Um, but it, you know, what, it's in, what this is indicating is that, that there is a significant value in the training that um, all training organisations and instructors um, contribute. Uh, control by left the um, measure of success is the, the, the casualty reaching the surface um, and again um, some of that is implicated in fatalities um, where either the, com the control by left is unsuccessful there is some reason for a separation during the ascent but more often than not um, it is a case of it being attempted by the divers too heavy and can't be lifted, um, or um, the, there is no gas to implement that uh, recovery, and a whole variety of factors. But um, you know, certainly, getting the casualty to the surface gives you an opportunity to apply the next things, which are CPR, uh, and the the identified percentages here, um, and the re the report compares that to um, the in the street CPR success um, and their improvements on the casualty survival rate. So um, the, the message that that gives is that that training is important and in particular that it is successful in, in reducing uh, the impact of diving incidents. Uh, and finally for uh, on the fatality side of things uh, and for completeness because we've reported it on, on a number consistently in recent years um, uh, is the involvement of divers using CCR. Uh, so three cases where um, we know that the diver um, who unfortunately died was using a CCR uh, and one where we think it's highly likely but we've got um, a, a very great deal of lack of information. Um, that in no way implies that it was a failure of the CCR in those fatalities. It's simply uh, to continue the, the trend of interest where divers um, 
are, are concerned about or are interested in uh, whether or not that particular type of uh, equipment was being used. So just to go on and look at some of the, the other types of in incidents. Um, we already mentioned that we classify the incidents in one of eight categories and, the, and these charts uh, represent incident rates rather than the number of incidents. Um, and, and those are calculated uh, using BSAC membership figures um, as a proxy for estimating the, the level of participation in the sport. We don't have um, any kind of re reliable uh, statistics for the amount of uh, participation in the sport that's going on, but we're using uh, BSAC membership figures as a proxy. And, and the trend lines here are a, a, a five year rolling average. And so looking at them, um, what we um, believe that we see here is, is a fairly level um, incident rate uh, for fatalities, and that's not to dismiss any of those fatalities. Every single one is a very significant tragedy in its own right. Um, uh, but it's, you, you could argue that there's a very slight increase over that time, but we're dealing with very small numbers um, as well. And, and there's, there's quite some quite considerable variation year on year. Um, so, but it, you know, we will keep an eye on it. On the other hand, uh, both DCI and ascent related incidents are, are demonstrating a very clear downward trend. Um, and we believe that that's very much due to the efforts of training agencies and instructors uh, over the last 10 or more years to place increasing emphasis on uh, the importance and the uh, of buoyancy control and the need to keep practicing that uh, and other diving skills. And, and so I think we're, we're fairly confident in saying that that has been having an impact. Um, whereas on boating and surfacing, uh, surface related incidents, uh, again, um, an initial decline from um, the early 2000s or the um, following on from a lot of effort that was put in in 1999 and 2000 from a variety of agencies uh, emphasizing the importance of uh, boat maintenance uh, and so on. And what we saw for about five years was a steady decline. Uh, and then we saw this upward trend again. Um, so boating and surface incidents either relate to boat breakdowns or uh, divers separated from their uh, surface cover uh, due to miscalculation of the tides. And, but what we saw is this increase and again, more and more emphasis on it. And so again, uh, this steady decline. Whereas technique related incidents, uh, equipment, injury and miscellaneous um, are all fairly steady. Uh, trends. Now, the difficulty with that is that overall on the incidents that we get reported, uh, we certainly do not capture every single incident that get, uh, that actually occurs. Um, we capture more of the more serious incidents than the miscellaneous, for example. Um, uh, and we're pretty confident that we capture as close to 100% of fatal diving incidents every year, um, a significant proportion, and we estimate ar around about a third of the incidents in, involving DCI, and then progressively fewer as you go th down through the, the less serious incidents. Um, but we capture sufficient, we believe, to be able to um, draw some conclusions in the way that we do in the, the overall report. Um, so just to uh, start winding up some encouragement about using the incident report. So the, the first and obvious thing is if you haven't to download the 2021 uh, report. 
uh, and you can also uh, download previous years for the last five or six years from the, uh, the main website um, and take the time to read it um, and, and to not just read the, the conclusions but I'll come back to it. Um, second thing is that this session is being recorded and so um, you know, will be available on the uh, BZ website in due course. Um, but in particular, don't just read the analysis of the report. Each individual incident, we produce a synopsis for of the, the, the detailed information such as we have it, um, which uh, you know, explains the circumstances it doesn't identify individuals or locations or anything like that. Um, it, we treat that kind of information in confidence, uh, but we do encourage you to read and to understand what happened um, in, the, in terms of each individual incident. We, we also don't draw individual conclusions on a, an incident. Um, we, we allow you to read it, and form your own view on it, but um, it, it's designed to help you avoid, um, you and others avoid similar problems. Um, and then in the conclusions of the report, um, we, we believe that the, the number of incidents is very clearly linked and, and there, increase, there is increasing evidence, particularly since 2014, of the number of incidents being directly linked to the amount of diving taking place. Um, during 2021, there was a slow start to diving attributable to um, the, the re remaining impacts of COVID-19. Um, but we believe 2021, um, the number of report, the amount of diving, we believe, uh, and the consequent number of incidents is close to pre-pandemic levels. There is some evidence of equipment failure may be linked to the, the layoff. Um, very sadly, there was uh, 15 um, incidents resulting in 16 diving fatalities. And amongst those uh, fatalities, the separation and solo, solo diving um, may be um, continuing in, uh, implications. Uh, but in particular, this year, there was a significant number of mi missing divers as a result of those fatalities. Uh, and then finally, uh, something that's been said for many, many years, some of the incidents within the report could possibly have been avoided had, had those incidents, um, those involved applied a few basic principles of safe diving. And additionally, um, had the opportunity been taken then, uh, or where it was taken, then the, the prevent being prevented from becoming more serious by the rescue skills and rapid support of the rescue services. So thank you from me uh, for listening so far. And Don will talk briefly about the uh, safety side of things. Yeah, thank you very much, Jim. I uh, I hope everyone's uh, found that interesting and informative. All, all the details there. I'd just like to wrap up uh, with with a few things. The first thing is, if you do have any questions, please put them in the chat. And I would like to say thanks to uh, to Tim for his observation about the number of uh, weekends that are were in. August 2020 versus uh, the number of uh, days, weekend days there were in 2021. That's a, it's a really interesting observation. Thank you. Um, the other thing I'd like to do is, is point you at that URL there, which is um, where you can find the incident report on all our other uh, safety replay, uh, safety related information. That, as I say, is, is available for anybody uh, who would find it useful. Um, one of the things that we do have on there is, is a BZAC safe diving guide, which we think is um, applicable beyond just um, our own members, our own organisation. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of general principles that are, are useful to keep people safe and which, are, which have come out of the incident reports. So you, you may like to have a look at on that. 
also um, the IPO advice um, based on you know the information we've had from Dr. Wilmhurst, uh, who, who you've obviously heard about from Jim. The, there's also a variety of other safety articles on, on, on all sorts of different topics um, that, that may be useful once again uh, and you, you wish to share with people. And last thing is that we've updated our COVID-19 guidance, which is on there. Obviously, it hasn't gone away. Uh, we've seen that, you know, in particular China, obviously, uh, you know, really suffering at the moment. But there's nothing to say, it, it, you know, we couldn't have another large outbreak in this country as well. So we've updated our guidance. It's on there. Um, and obviously, it's once again, it's, it's for anybody who wishes to use it. Um, Having said that was the last thing, it's not the last thing. The last thing I'm going to do is, is give you some dates for next year, which is the uh, incident report for this year. Obviously, we haven't got all the data for it yet. Uh, we need to analyze the data, but we will be publishing the report on the 31st of October. And there'll be more presentations, one um, aimed more at BZAC members, which is the 18th of November and one for the diving industry so this presentation next year will be on tuesday the 6th of december uh, and you know once again you're all welcome to attend and i hope you will i hope you found it useful and informative and uh, you know please you know pass on to other people in the dive industry um it would be great to, to to see as many people as possible um and that is pretty much it really other than uh, to leave you with the uh that's where you get the instant report. And uh, if you've got any questions, um, Jim or myself will be very happy to pick them up. Um, what we want to do is encourage every organization to help contribute to uh, the, the body of evidence that we have here. And, and without doubt, the, the more information and the more detail there is, then the, the better we believe we can uh, make the reporting and therefore the analysis and therefore diving safer. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through. So what I would say, if anyone does have any questions, please contact Jim or myself. You know, you think of something afterwards, then then please uh, get in touch. Otherwise, um, well, as I say, please let everyone know this uh, presentation, uh, I think is going to be available online as a video. Is that correct, Jim? Um, the, the plan is to um, collate it and uh, put it on the, the Q&A session won't be uh, recorded, uh, but the rest of it will. And what, we're not quite sure where we're going to place it yet, um, but everybody that's attended, we will notify that the recording is available if you want to share it with your colleagues. And, and again, that's uh, a useful opportunity to uh, spread the message um, you also have it available at your dive centre or um, you know, share it with other instructors I think is, is, is a useful way of getting the information out there. Brilliant. Okay well on that note everyone I will wish you all farewell and um, we'll speak we'll see we'll see you next year if not before. Thank you.